Hey guys, welcome back. So now we have reached the conclusion of the Death Hunters, which again is like an event within an event within itself, because beyond this, there's still the build up to the multiversal war, as well as the events that we see taking place within Judgment Day. So keep that in mind, because this is just the conclusion of the Death Hunters, because the bigger story yet continues from here. So with that said, let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so when we jump back in, we pick up right from the attack on Avengers Mountain from Doom Supreme and Kid Thanos, who had slipped away, leaving Avengers Mountain in complete and utter devastation. And it's here where we see Captain America, Captain Marvel, Brandy Selby, the star brand, making their way back with the one remaining death block that they were able to save in Kansas City. And with them making their way back, they try to reach out to Avengers Mountain, but they get no response. And Cap doesn't like how this is looking, with them getting attacked in Kansas City, as well as Thor and Tony getting attacked in Asgard, and Avengers Mountain just going silent. And he even suggests that Carol flies ahead to check it out before they get there, but she lets Cap know that it's probably not the best idea that they split up right now. And aside from that, Carol also has her concerns about Brandy, because when she aged up after using the full power to start, brand there's really no telling what that truly means but with brandy doing this the one deathlock that they were able to save he's grateful because with brandy literally sacrificing years of her life to save him he vows to her that he will do everything in his power to make sure that her sacrifice was not in vain but then he gets one shot through the back in that vow that he had just made it means nothing now. And we quickly find out that this attack had came from the Dark Phoenix Berserker Thor, as we see his hammer fly back to him, which quickly lets us know that the fight that started in Asgard has made its way to Earth. But then also, it's here where 616 Thor arrives shortly after, where we start to slip into the realm of narrative points that didn't age well. Because when Thor sees this berserker and he tells him that there's no way that you could have been an actual Thor or a true Thor on his world. And it's here where the Dark Phoenix says that he was, and not only that, but also that he's her son. To where then, Berserker Thor confirms. And if you guys remember, I mentioned before on this playlist that during the time that the Death Hunters event was going, that this was taking place in Jason Aaron's Avengers, well before we got the definitive answer in Donny Cates, Thor God of Hammers. So kind of keep that in mind as we go through some of this stuff with Thor. Because there are a lot of moments throughout this story that play off of the suspense and the build up to who Thor's mother actually is, which again, is no longer a mystery. But at this point in the story, we do kind of play with the idea a bit more. Because when Echo arrives and she attacks the Berserker and takes his hammer, this Phoenix and Thor versus Phoenix and Thor tag team match, it feeds into it as well. But before we get into that, we then go back to Avengers Mountain, where we find Namor lifting a portion of the wreckage from the damaged Celestial and calling for any Avenger who may have survived underneath to hurry up and crawl out because this thing heavy. And with them saying this right away, we then see T'Challa doing the same to give any survivor the chance of getting out, while also low-key pointing out to Namor that he didn't ditch everybody else either, because both of these guys had the split-second decision to either stay behind or try to escape the blast, but both of them stayed. But then also in this moment with Namor being way stronger than T'Challa on his best day, we also find that his Red Panther suit, vibranium force shields are at maximum power, which means walking out of here, his suit will go back to black. But before we just brush over that, I do want to say that with T'Challa using this Red Panther upgrade for the brief moment that he did, that hopefully this isn't the last that we've seen of it. Because with its anti-magic protocols, metallicized Orisha blood armor, and knuckles made from the stones of the necropolis, like the way that this thing is specked out, it makes you really wonder what he can really do with this suit. Because if it's enough to chase off the doom above all, it then just really leaves us to wonder how this suit would match up to either other magic users or supernatural enemies. So fingers crossed that we see more of it again. And on top of that, let me know in the comments when and where you'd like to see the Red Panther suit come back. But at this time with Namor and T'Challa holding up the wreckage from Avengers Mountain, Jane Foster Valkyrie, she tells both of them not to budge because she had found the Deathlock who was trying to awaken the Celestial critically injured. So she has to do surgery on him right away because there's no time to move him. So she uses the all weapon to create a scalpel and she does just that. But then from here, we then jump back over to the Phoenix Thor tag team where we find Thor using a lightning attack attack on this berserker but it does nothing and it's here where echo lets thor know that this berserker who is a corrupted thor who has been corrupted by the dark phoenix he's more firebird than thunder god and you can't kill a phoenix with lightning because only a phoenix can burn a phoenix and we're not talking about hosts we're talking about phoenix versus phoenix here and maybe it's just me but this just conflicts everything i thought i knew about the phoenix 
or at least what I believed I had learned in the Phoenix Force handbook when it said that the Phoenix Force is the nexus of all psionic energy that has, does, and ever will exist in all realities of the multiverse, who's also reborn at the beginning of every cosmos. But I mean, hey, I could be missing something but we're just gonna keep it pushing for the time being. But as soon as Echo says this, Dark Phoenix binds her and the Berserker gets his hammer back. And right away the Berserker starts getting the upper hand on Thor again, while Echo's in the background telling Thor, you got fire inside of you, use it. And it's here where Thor says, I am Thor, son of, and Echo finishes his sentence saying son of the Thunderbird, the god of the firestorm. And right then Thor hits this Berserker with the fire Hadouken which again, at the time, plays back into the mystery of who Thor's mother is, which I won't spoil for anyone who's just getting caught up and they're new to all of this, but I also don't want to go back and talk about this and not tell you that it's not the Phoenix. So at this point, if you're fresh jumping into Jason Aaron's Avengers and you haven't read Donny Cates' Thor yet, the latest Thor series will get you caught up, more specifically during God of Hammers. Though I do feel like at some point during this playlist, I did mention the answer to that. So if you're one of the few that doesn't know and you want to keep it a mystery, I'll just say you've been warned before you go in that comment section. Because we did talk about it before and there might be a person or two who may mention it in the comments below. But from here with the Dark Phoenix and her Berserker defeated, we find that Tony's caught up with the gang and Captain Marvel she's carrying the jet because Captain America is the only Avenger inside that cannot fly. But with this crew meeting back together, they make their way to Avengers Mountain to figure out why it has gone completely silent. And just below the mountain we find Doom Supreme and Kid Thanos with them watching Avengers Mountain burn and Doom saying the last Deathlock on this planet is deceased, which pretty much means that their job is done. Because again, they only came here to kill Deathlocks. And so with them here, of course, Kid Thanos is like, okay, well, if we're done, why are we still here? And as soon as he says that, Mephisto shows up with his Iron Inquisitor. And when they get here, there's a bit of tension between Mephisto and Doom Supreme. Because if you guys remember, back in Avengers issue 750, these two had made an agreement to where Doom agreed that with the multiversal masters of evil conquering different worlds across the multiverse, that they would save Earth 616 for last. So with Mephisto arriving here and him telling Doom Supreme, did you think I wouldn't notice what you done? And right away it gives that awkward moment cause Doom, he's just like, nah, these Deathlocks, man, who's the Deathlocks was out here? Who's killing them? We ain't rewrite time out here, ain't nothing changed. As Avengers Mountain is just burning in the background. But Mephisto lets Doom Supreme know that that's not why he's here. But instead, Mephisto's reason for coming here, it goes a bit deeper. Because Mephisto's upset with Doom Supreme for killing the orb. And really not so much for killing the orb, but burning the Watcher's eye after killing the orb. And when we've seen Doom Supreme destroy the Watcher's eye before, it was done in a way to where he didn't care because he didn't think it would be any use to him. Because eventually, him and the Multiversal Masters of Evil, they're just going to rewrite history here at some point anyway. But Mephisto calls Doom Supreme out. And he tells Doom, no, you destroyed it because you didn't want me to get to it. And it's right then when Mephisto tells Doom to go ahead and unburn it, <laughs> respectfully, and Mephisto tells him to don't bother to lie and say that he can't because he can tell if a man is lying, even if he's a man behind the mask. But with Mephisto saying this, Doom doesn't even argue or say that Mephisto's wrong, but instead he unburns the eye and he takes a bite out of it. Because before he just hands it back to Mephisto, Doom Supreme wants to make sure that he gets a bit of this insight to these secrets as well. But interestingly enough, after taking this bite, he just calls for Kid Thanos, and then from there, the two of them just meet up with the other multiversal masters of evil. But as soon as the two of them leave, the Iron Inquisitor tells Mephisto that Doom definitely knows now. He knows what the Council of Red are planning. And Mephisto says that he knows that Doom knows. But also with Doom knowing this, it's the only reason that Doom didn't try to kill Mephisto just now. Because Doom Supreme is not going to take that chance or opportunity to get rid of Mephisto until he figures out how to make it a win completely for himself. And with the Iron Inquisitor asking Mephisto, okay, so when they come, how do we deal with Doom Supreme and the Masters of Evil? And it's from here where Mephisto then consumes the rest of the Watcher's eye in order to see how many bites it takes to figure that out. And from there, they just throw the orb's body into the water. And just after this, we then find that the rest of the Avengers, they made their way back and the team's pretty much reassembled again, with the exception of Robbie Reyes, with his story that spins off into Avengers Forever. But with everyone coming together here, Namor, he's more or less like, okay, looks like you guys got it from here, I'm out. And he tries to tell him like he'll come back if needed. But then Captain America hits him with the quick, no you don't, like not so fast. And Cap lets Namor know because of the trouble that Namor has caused in the past few months, just the past few months that he is placing Namor in Avengers custody because him hanging around for a few hours just because Jennifer Walters made Namor feel guilty for a little bit that's not enough and with hearing this Namor just agrees and he goes along with it 
But then it's from here where we get the ending with a bit of a twist to it. Because it's here where we find that the Deathlock, who had attempted to awaken the Celestial, he's not dead. But the Avengers aren't entirely sure if he's alive either. Because with Jane being able to save his body by performing on-site all-weapon surgery, she needs to keep him connected to the Celestial to keep him breathing. And aside from that, at this time, he's showing no brain activity. And so from here, a couple things happen to close this out. Because for one, the Avengers, immediately they call a meeting. Because even though the Deathlocks who had came to this world got slaughtered, they did successfully get their message to the Avengers. But now the Avengers got to figure out what they're going to do about it. But then from here, we hear the thought narration of this Deathlock saying that the Avengers are not ready for this fight unlike any other, a fight for all the worlds. But then this Deathlock mentions that they need his help, but he feels trapped within a broken, weakened body, a body that doesn't even feel like his own, a body that's as big as a mountain. Because the last Deathlock that has survived, he is now tethered to the body of the progenitor Celestial, which leaves us with an interesting cliffhanger for the Deathlock who got away. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below so we can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.